Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and we welcome you to uh, this, our third budget hearing in the process of adopting a budget for our fiscal year 2020-21, and we welcome each one of you here. We officially call to order this budget hearing meeting. And for those of you that are viewing at home, we welcome you always. We are live streaming, and thank you for uh, watching as we conduct county business tonight. As we've said many times, we this is not our favorite way of doing things, but on the other hand, it's good that we have this capability and so that people can uh, be observant of county business uh, in the uh, safety of their own home and uh, as we conduct that business. So we thank all of you for being here tonight. And uh, please note that we are uh, being a little more um, restrictive in our social distancing than we've been. We, we had a couple of folks that sort of uh, made note that maybe we uh, should be doing a little better job. So we are, uh, we are that's the reason you see the tape, the every other row and uh, the seats that are appropriately spaced. So again, thank you for, uh, for being here tonight. And we're going to uh, proceed with this meeting. I will note to the uh, commissioners that there's one addition to our agenda. The Liberty Northeast Fire Department is here tonight to present. So uh, we're adding that to the fire department presentations tonight. So with that, we welcome each one of you again, and we will uh, start with our outside agencies. And first up is Randolph Senior Adults. Mark. Good evening, uh, Chairman Fry, Board of Commissioners, and senior county staff. Thank you again for hosting us as we make budget requests for the new fiscal year of 2021. The first slide you have in your packet um, is just a reminder of the mission statement uh, and the goals of Randolph Senior Adults and how we go about um, trying to achieve those. So I'm not going to spend any time there, but you have those for reference points. Uh, at your convenience. If we go to the next slide, the reason that I'm here this evening making a presentation is because that Randolph Senior Adults is requesting an increase in funding uh, from Randolph County. Um, we, as you'll note on this slide, we've had five consecutive years of uh, flat funding from the county. Uh, however, our requests for services have significantly increased over that period of time. We don't take lightly your role with the annual budget and therefore we only want to request increases when absolutely necessary. But as you will see, we're requesting an increase to $313,585. Reasons for uh, making that request, um, prior to the impact of COVID-19, our meal program volumes had already gone up by 20%. So from uh, July 1 of last year through February of this year, before COVID impacted our community, we were already experiencing a 20% increase. Last fiscal year, we served approximately 76,000 meals. Uh, that's both congregate and Meals on Wheels combined. Through February, if you annualize our, those eight months of numbers, we were on pace to do about 91,000 meals. Our congregate Meals, those are the meals where a client comes into one of our five senior centers and has a meal with our staff. Uh, they were up about 12% and our Meals on Wheels volumes were up 23%. When you combine those numbers together, it comes out to be a 20% increase or 15,183 additional meals uh, year over year. In addition, uh, the beginning of this fiscal year, saw us starting a new catering contract. Typically our contracts are for three year uh, time frames. And uh, this time last year, we were ending a, a catering period and we selected a new catering partner. As would be expected after a three year period where the price is locked in, our price did go up and our cost per meal. Our cost per meal went up from $3.24 $3 per meal to $4.15 per meal. 
The good news is, is that 415 is locked in for another two years. So we will not experience meal cost increases at least until July of 2022. Uh, just would also mention, I think you've heard me say this before, we're very pleased with Golden Corral out of Lexington, their catering division in the service and the quality of meals they've provided to our senior adults. Uh, I want to go ahead and just at least share with you what the impact of COVID has been. Um, since uh, March of this year, um, if you factor in what's happened in March, April, and May, we're up almost 30% uh, in terms of uh, requests for meals. Again, last year, about 76,000 meals, but through May, we were on pace to serve almost, not, well, a little bit over 97,000 meals. Uh, congregate is the area that's grown significantly during the COVID period. Um, they're up uh, about 28%, as is Meals on Wheels, also about 28%. So um, that would be about a 21,000 meal uh, increase year over year. As most of you know, we closed all of our all five of our centers at the end of the day on March the 18th, which this Thursday will be 90 days. Um, since that time, we've continued to serve meals through our four meal categories, congregate meals on wheels, frozen route, and frozen pickup. I would mention that frozen route and frozen pickup are a subset under the um, meals on wheels program. We've now delivered seven rounds of 10 frozen meals to every client that we serve every two weeks. And as of the end of last week, when we did our seventh round, we have now served 29,510 meals since we closed our centers almost 90 days ago. So almost 30,000 meals. So we've continued to provide service to our clients in the, in the most important category, which is a nutritious meal. RCATS has continued to run trips in Randolph and Montgomery County throughout the pandemic. We have not missed a single day uh, of RCATS trips. And I would point out that one of the most critical, critical aspects about RCATS is that we're a primary provider of trips for dialysis. And uh, the dialysis patients, that's kind of a life or death uh, ability to get to, to their appointment and go through that treatment. Our information and options counseling, which handles the Medicare uh, open enrollment and all those um, SHIP or, or seniors health insurance uh, questions. We continue to meet with clients via telephone instead of in person. And I would go ahead and say that due to um, the at risk or vulnerable population that we serve, we anticipate being one of the last organizations allowed to reopen. It'll be at least phase three, and it depends on what phase three looks like when it when it hits so why have our meal programs increased so significantly uh, you've um, heard me before talk about the demographics of randolph county if we look at our own uh, 2016 strategic plan from the years 2016 to 2031 uh, it was expected that 99 percent of our population growth would be 65 years of age and older and the state of North Carolina, by the end of this year, the 60 plus age demographic will exceed the zero to 17 demographic for the first time in the history of our state. In addition, um, the COVID-19 uh, impact has made a difference. Um, many of your congregate clients, again, those clients that, that come into our centers, <clears throat> many of them have expressed concern about either going to the grocery store or even going to get takeout because they don't feel comfortable being out in the community uh, in this pandemic. The second thing I would point out is I believe that at St. Randolph Senior Adults, we've done a better job of making the senior population in this community aware of the services that we provide. We've tried to increase our visibility. Um, we are speaking at many more engagements or opportunities uh, when those are presented to us and we have enhanced our website and our social media presence. So we have more and more people reaching out to us about the services that we provide. This next slide, uh, again, I won't spend uh, much time on this. This is just a list of the various funding sources that we have at Randolph Senior Adults. I would point out that um, 
you know, for the COVID period, we're very fortunate in that some of the CARES Act stimulus funds are being made available to us. Uh, at um, When we were here for the block grant, we talked about the Families First program, which will augment um, or supplement our meal programs. Unfortunately, these are all one-time funding sources. They're not recurring. And so if our, if our increases were only based on COVID-19, I wouldn't be here before you. But as we talked about at the beginning of this presentation, we were up 20% before COVID-19 hit. So, um, so that you don't feel like we're picking on the county, we have requested funding increases from all of our regular funding sources for the fiscal year 2021. And I want to just remind you uh, as I close of the three primary benefits of a meal to a senior adult. The first is obvious, it's a nutritious meal. And for most of our clients, it's the only nutritious meal they will have that day. Um, it has to meet certain USDA requirements. It must meet one third of the daily um, uh, food requirements. We have to have a menu approved by a dietitian uh, for every meal that we serve. The second benefit of the meals we serve is it's a wellness check. Whether you're coming into one of our centers or you're receiving a Meals on Wheels meal, um, our folks are doing wellness checks. If you've ever delivered uh, Meals on Wheels, you get to know your clients um, during that time. And uh, you, know, you know when uh, Mrs. Smith is not feeling well or you can sense that. And we ask our volunteers to come back and share that with our centers so we can check on them. And then the, the third benefit to uh, serving the meals is simply the social interaction. Uh, a sad commentary, but for many of our clients, it will be the only social interaction they'll have that day is either interacting with a volunteer on their front doorstep or when they come into the congregate center and have that meal. And social interaction, frankly, is just as important as the nutritious meal to the well-being of our senior adults. So. Um, without an increase in funding based on the fact that our services have gone up dramatically, if we're not able to receive additional funding from um, our regular sources, we will be forced to suspend some services. And by that I mean under the meal program, we no longer have a waiting list. We're able to serve Meals on Wheels clients and congregate clients as they request the service. Um, we started in November of 2018 with a frozen route, um, and this allowed us to provide meals to people in the more remote parts of the county. Um, but if we don't have the funding, that those will be the areas that we will have to, to uh, cut. And so, um, again, I'm, I'm very appreciative to the years and years of support you've provided to uh, Randolph Senior Adults. You have designated us as the lead agency uh, and so we are very appreciative of what you do for senior adults in this community. Be glad to try and answer any questions that you have at this time. Any questions? <clears throat> this is, I, for clarity, uh, with your funding sources and all, you say you've talked to, or I assume you've talked to some of these, these uh, uh, fund, funding people uh, that you've got listed here. Do you have any idea of how, how these are Coming in positive, negative, or whatever? <laughs> yes, uh, the answer is yes, uh, positive and negative. The, um, uh, just like Randolph County, um, all of these folks require a grant application sure. to be completed. Uh, some of those we've heard from, some of those we've ha we have not. The United Way, we, we actually get funding from the United Way of Randolph County and Greater High Point, since we have an Archdale Center, they provide funding for Archdale and Trinity. Both uh, organizations have decided that instead of giving us an annual allocation, they're going to give us quarterly allocations because they just don't know how their funding is gonna come in. If people have been furloughed or, te or terminated from their employment, then there's no uh, payroll deduction funds to be dispersed out into the community. So uh, both of those uh, organizations were actually taking a hit. Uh, it will be a negative um, uh, impact to us. Um, we've heard from a few municipalities that are going to bump us up uh, a little bit. Uh, and then we've had some that have said, we just don't know what our, our budget numbers are going to provide. So usually it's 
probably the end of this month when you're finishing your physical year before you've heard from everybody. So again, the, the CARES Act stimulus money is great for where we are today, but it's not recurring to help us with that 20% volume increase. Into, into basically grant folks have responsive. We have, um, we have received a special COVID grant from Timken, from the Wachovia, or I'm sorry, Wells Fargo Foundation. Um, we've re there's a program in High Point called the Emergency Relief Fund we've applied to. Uh, we've applied to North Carolina Health uh, Care um, uh, grant program. There's a number that, um, if we found one that, that our services seem to meet the criteria, we have applied. Other questions? Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Very interesting. Can you introduce the schools? Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for hearing us this evening. I'm Paula Owens with Communities and Schools of Randolph County. And I too am just going to give you a brief report of our uh, COVID-19 um, experience and activity. We did not close. Um, when we found out on March, what was that, the 13th? Seems like that was a Friday the 13th. Um, hmm. That we were, that the schools were shutting down, we had to go into um, emergency mode. What do we do next? And so we spent some time in conversation with both school districts about how, what, what was the need you know, in terms of especially feeding during this time. So that's been a large part of our focus. Um, thankfully, the school system staffs have, been, have worked with us closely to help determine the need as it extended beyond what we were normally doing. So during the time of COVID between at the end, at, in March when the schools closed, we were serving 635 students weekly with backpack pals. At the end of, at the, at June 5th, when schools closed, we were serving 679. So we had about a weekly, so we had about a 7% growth during that time. Fortunately, through donations from the community um, and do, of both food and funding, we were able to step up and meet the need. We've not had a problem with that. Um, I too have applied for every grant coming and going and I've received some positive response and some negative. I feel like that's all I've done, in fact, since March, in the middle of March, is apply for grants. I even pulled one of my staff members in from his permanent assignment at Randleman for a couple of days a week to help me manage backpack piles because that became almost a full-time adventure. Um, for one thing, we partner with lots of churches and some of the churches for obvious reasons, mo almost all the churches had closed down, so they were not in a position to help us with the program like they had been. And so, with the exception of a few, we had to take that on. So even though our actual number of growth was only 7%, our growth in the number of bags that we were providing was over 50% because of churches that were unable to meet their previous commitment, which is very understandable. Um, some churches were able to pick up, and then we've had uh, contributions from all three Rotary Clubs in the area and Kiwanis, and people have just been amazing. So we've not been standing with a can on the street corner, thankfully, trying to get money to feed kids. We've even had a couple of anonymous donations where people show up at the office and give us money and won't tell us who they are. They just say, it's for your Backpack Pal program. So I'm very grateful to this community for supporting that need. Um, so this summer, uh, we're going to change our, in the past we've done a summer program, but it was mostly through deliveries to the local summer school sites. This year we see that there won't be any summer school and we have to figure out another way. So we have worked with social work leads in both districts and um, we are working We've put together a list with their help of the students that will need a backpack pile every week this summer. And so we begin that 
this Wednesday and we will be making deliveries to their homes. At this point, we're at 104 students. I'm certain that will grow, um, but that is what we have at, as of the moment. So, and this is a first for us doing that, but I've been able to bring in some very part-time help from our existing staff to help us make this happen. So we're taking a leap of faith that, that we can make this work and that this may indeed be our model going forward for summer food delivery. Um, what we're doing is a bi-weekly delivery, which is what we did through the school system as well. So they get double bags every other week. Um, another thing that happened is you may know the mentoring program is a big part of what we do in the schools is bring community resources into the schools. And before the schools were closed, we knew that volunteers were not going to be allowed in the building. So we were already working to figure out a way to adjust to that. And then we of course had to adjust the fact that nobody was in the building. So our, um, our site staff reached out to all the volunteers and we began a pen pal program between them and their mentees. And they mailed us letters at the office or some mailed them to the school site and our site staff picked them up. We readdressed them, sent them to the students with a self-addressed stamped envelope so they could return the letters and we've had that communication going all summer. In addition to that, not summer, I feel like it's summer, but it's, it actually was during the school year. It's just the craziest time ever. Um, then we um, also, our staff was asked to, con to contact their students at least bi-weekly, depending on the number they had on their case. We have some students like Beth Allen at Southmont has 65 kids on her caseload. So it's hard to make 65 phone calls in a week, one person. But um, so she was contacting hers bi-weekly and they use Classroom Dojo as a means of contact, which is a digital um, platform. They used um, snail mail, um, email and phone calls and, and were able to make at li over 766 separate contacts during the months of school closure. And um, I was pretty proud of that. They documented all of that. We required a login sheet so we knew what they were doing and most of that work was done at their home. We also did some remote learning for our staff, some professional development. We took that opportunity to try to grow, grow the staff professionally, including a book study uh, on a book called Resilience Breakthrough, which works, it talks about how to um, work with trauma-informed care and to help students build resilience as they face tough times. It couldn't have, we chose that book before the pandemic, but it was very timely. Um, we also, our staff also sent postcards, encouraging words. Um, some of the mentors actually sent packages to us at the CIS office for us to forward to their kids. It was quite, quite heartwarming. Um, and then we also try, we supported our volunteers. We normally give them a luncheon every year. We couldn't do that this year, so we gave them a small gift card, each one. Uh, there were 96 of them, and we sent those out with a thank you, you know, for all that they had done for, to support us. And we tried to keep in touch with them too, because many of them really look forward, in fact, all of them do, I think, to the work that they do in the schools. We are not requesting an increase in funding, uh, but we hope that we can hold the line, that you can support us as you have done so graciously in the past many years. And we are very grateful for this continued support and for trusting us to be good stewards of taxpayer funds. All nonprofits are rightfully concerned about revenue, as I'm sure you know, we're all concerned about revenue going forward. And we want you to know how much we depend upon your support and are certainly appreciative of it. None of us know yet precisely what school will look like in 2021. I can't imagine being back in the schoolhouse as an administrator right now, or especially in Dr. Ganey or Dr. Woody's uh, seat. The, you couldn't pay me enough, quite frankly. Um, but thank, thankful, I'm thankful that we have them as partners in this quest to do what kid, to help surround 
kids with wraparound supports to help them be successful. I think we're all going to be tasked beyond our normal comfort zone and then some in the coming year and possibly years beyond. We will continue to collaborate with our school partners and are positioning ourselves to be as flexible as possible to accommodate the needs of local students and the schools. So thank you so much for hearing me out. And if there are any questions, I'll try to answer them. Very good, good program. Thank you. Yes. Questions, comments? Oh, I know. Would your organization be eligible for some of the CARES funding and those because of the food aspect? And we did apply for and get, we just found this out, an emergency food and shelter um, allot, allotment this year for the first time ever, and it was because of, we just found that out. And that will that is going to fund our entire summer program and may even help us some into, extend into the fall. So we're very excited about that. I've applied for lots of things, and like Mark said, I've gotten some positive, some negative. We are going to apply for a PPP loan. We didn't feel it was the right step for us at first because of the restriction in time that you could use it. And our payroll is not very large, but it is still the largest expense we have. But at the time those came out, we didn't only had a couple more months for our people to work. So I thought, oh, I just don't know about this. So I've been watching and waiting, and now we think, so we hope and pray that we can get a little help in that area because we do predict that our donations will be down. So do I understand you haven't actually been awarded or you're still waiting for an answer, or you have, we, do have it? We do not have the PPP yet. We are actually, we have not applied. We are doing that this okay. week. Right after the new regulations came out or the new protocols for that, that gives you an extension of time, then that allows us to apply for an amount that would really help us. And the fact that it's 60% of your payroll now instead of 75%, because we just, in the summer months, we don't have a large payroll. And, we, and I didn't know when, how soon the grant would be awarded at first. And I thought it is probably gonna hit us about in the summer and it's going to be almost moved. Now it makes it, gives us a little more flexibility. So we're on it. <laughs> we'll see what happens. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks, Paul. Next is our TDA. Uh, I know David, you're, Amber, you're, you're presenting. Come right ahead. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board, thank you for your time this evening. We'll move this up a little bit, a little bit taller. We come to you this evening with a presentation of our 2021 proposed budgets for the Heart of North Carolina Visitors Bureau and the I-73-74 Visitor Centers. As an overview of our organizational structure, the Randolph County Tourism Development Authority is legislated by the State of North Carolina in House Bill 337, granted by the North Carolina General Assembly in July 1997 to levy a room tax in tourism development at a rate of 5%. These collections are the sole funding of the Heart of North Carolina Visitors Bureau, the official destination marketing organization for Randolph County, representing all nine municipalities. We uphold responsibilities of reinvesting this visitor paid occupancy tax into strategic marketing for our tourism assets. Additionally, the Randolph County TDA operates the I-73-74 Visitor Centers just south of Seagrove. The Visitor Center budget is an agreement with the North Carolina Department of Transportation through a special appropriation by the North Carolina General Assembly. We began operations of the Visitor Centers in July 2012 and have maintained the staffing and operation of these centers with no increase to date of those funds. While COVID-19 has drastically affected the Heart of North Carolina Visitors Bureau budget, the Visitor Center budget has, be, has been fulfilled for the 2019-20 year and the contract is in place for the 2020-21 year 
with a routine amount of $185,716 for operation of both centers. And I'll now turn over to Amber Skeen, our Director of Office Administration, for the presentation of the 2020-21 proposed budgets for the I-7374 Visitor Centers and the Heart of North Carolina Visitors Bureau, beginning on page seven of the document presented. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, as you see on page seven, uh, the Visitor Centers um, personnel cost is $100,063. And 100 and I'm start over on that. 163,117 dollars. Um, that includes one full-time personnel and nine part-time personnel. Um, we also just right now have six part-time personnel working. Um, three of the part-times did not feel comfortable coming back into the workforce. So we just recently have hired one position. She will start. Um, July 1 and then the other two we are still taking active applications for and hope to have them filled by August. Um, the next page you will see that this is the operating cost which is a total of $22,599. Um, again our total budget has not changed. Um, we have had to move some monies around in different categories just to fulfill the accounts that are needed. Um, and then we'll go on to the HNCVB budget. Um, so with the budget cuts and everything that we're having to look at to um, the current budget, 1920 um, was a $1.1 million. Unfortunately, with COVID, we've had to drastically reduce that. Um, we've had to furlough two full-time employees and eliminate one part-time position completely. Um, we've had to um, we've gone from a staff of six to a staff of two, basically. So a big cut. Um, we've also, this has helped us by $6,500 um, doing these cuts. In marketing, we've re reduced um, different line items, not buying office supplies, um, trying to just really cut down the needs um, of our office. So we've cut that down um, over $10,000. Um, we do hope that travel will remain or start coming back up in the fall of um, and winter of this this year, but we just don't know this has impact our hotels drastically. So with that, we are only looking at a $700,000 budget um, in the next budget year. This is a 36% decrease from what we have had in the past. So personnel, um, we have cut down to $191,191. Um, again, this is only includes three full-time staff members. We have had to cut two full-time staff members completely um, and eliminate our part-time position. So our office is really only gonna be three people operating instead of five like we've had in the past. Um, and then this is our operating cost. Um, we have a budget of, of $87,750. And then the next slide shows the marketing cost. Um, this also includes all the sponsorships, advertisements that we're going to be able to do. So this is a budget of $421,059. So again, we've cut the budget um, over $400,000 this year just to try to help with the impact that COVID-19 has brought to our organization. Is there any questions? What, what are you budgeting for the proposed fall furniture market? We don't know. <laughs> Have you made any allowance in this budget for, for furniture market? For promotion? For revenue? Well, what we've bundled in is um, the sponsors and mar sponsorship and marketing assistance of $40,000. That'll be spread throughout nine, or nine municipalities. You know, when I mentioned, uh, or when I came to the Duty Commissioner's meeting and had that $17,000 revenue,
your fall market look similar to that? question thank you both David thank you thanks for coming tonight shelter of hope Paulette not here and of Arch Guild David Grace. Good evening. Good evening, Chairman Fry and Commissioners. My name is David Gaskin, and I'm the Vice President of the Randolph Arts Guild. And with me tonight is Grace Moffat, who is our current President of the Randolph Arts Guild. First of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity of allowing us to present our budget to you tonight and um, request funding from you. And we realize that this is a gift to us and we take it as such and we appreciate the opportunity for us to be stewards of that. I want to say that first of all, as everyone has noted tonight, that it's been a challenging year with the impact of COVID-19 and it has especially been hard in um, communities where you're trying to find funds to help do programs that are at the top of the hierarchical curve, if you will, not the need-based food and shelter type programs. Um, but we greatly appreciate you considering us. Um, one of the things that um, I hope you will remember is that the Art Guild was founded 50 years ago. And this year we are actually celebrating our 50th year and had a big celebration plan where we were hoping to bring in a lot of funds and guess what, that was canceled. Um, but we have also continued to move forward and one of the things that the Randolph Arts Guild does is it's the only organization in the county that provides funding for all genres of artistic expression including painting, drawing, sculpture, ceramics, photography, music, theater, dance, literature, and film. And I think everyone in this room knows the importance of the arts to a community like Randolph County. Um, all <clears throat> numbers of studies have been done that show the impact of having a artistic expression in your community and how that helps draw businesses in and gives people in the community a sense of well-being. And so we hope that um, that will continue, obviously. Um, the funds that we're requesting will help bring in programs such as the homeschool program, the elder arts program, monthly gallery exhibits, concerts, and multicultural events, as well as maintaining a building that we call home, which just happens to be 110 years old. And so um, one of the things that's been tough this year is that the North Carolina Arts Council has notified all agencies that receive funds from them that in 2000, 2021, um, there's gonna be a real, excuse me, in the, the next year, there's gonna be a real challenge and that they will not be funding organizations for the following year. And that's going to result in a loss to us of about uh, 19000 in operational funds for the guild itself, and then also about 18000 in funds for sub-grantees that we send funds to. And that will affect arts education programs all throughout our community. Past sub-grantees who we have sponsored have included the Randolph Youth Theater, Communities and Schools, Symphony Visits and Jazz, jazz Concerts uh, for County and City School students. But we are trying to remain viable and active financially. One of the things that we had an opportunity to do was to consult with an agent out of the North Carolina Arts Council about expanding programs and growing. And when we met with her, it was right before um, the midst of the pandemic and we knew we were going to have financial challenges and so we asked her to totally revise her consulting arrangement with us so that we could strictly focus on strengthening ourselves financially and this has been a good opportunity for us this year to really kind of sit back and say do we have all of our ducks in a row is our structure in place 
And so we have really focused heavily in that consulting arrangement and just making sure that we're going to be strong and can take us forward for another 50 years. So we're excited about that. Um, one of the things that we've also done is we've applied for the PPP loan. And this was at the advice of our accounting firm as well as the North Carolina Arts Council. And we were awarded a loan of close to $29,000. And that is going to help us. The, it was alluded to a few minutes ago that the loan has been extended to 24 weeks. And that's critical for organizations like us because we've been unable to bring people back. And so we'll now be able to extend that, those funds out further. Um, it's also going to allow us to pay for utilities, and that has been very helpful too. And that amount has come down from um, what was 25% to now they're going to allow, it looks like, 40% to go towards that of those funds. We also did a board appeal about two months ago. We had a, one of our board members said that he would match $100 for every $100 that a board member gave. And so we had, um, we were able to raise about $2,000 through that uh, request. Um, and we also continue to look for grants through all the sources we can find um, to help keep us afloat and strong. Um, one of the things that has shown just the way people in all walks of business are being creative, I think, is highlighted in what the Art Guild has done. Um, one of our biggest fundraisers is the annual rummage sale. And we're very grateful to the town of Randleman and so many volunteers that have allowed us to use the old Firestone building there. And th this year we had a big challenge because we knew that people can't come in. And so we opened it up to by invita invitation only. You had to schedule appointments. And I'm proud to say that as of today, we've raised more money than we ever had in the process of doing that event. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We've learned something interesting through that. But just the creativity and thinking outside the box has really helped us. Um, the other thing I'd just like to express is that um, one of the things that um, has really been born from this environment we're in right now is just really drawing on our members. And we have had so many volunteers step forward to help with helping with the budget preparation, helping with the funding for the grants, the request to, for that. And then in addition, we've had donations come in from uh, unsolicited uh, members who just have sent checks for $1,000 here and there. So it's been a really wonderful experience, um, but also a very trying one. So what's going forward now is we're looking at the fall festival. And I can tell you, a lot of the people that participate in the fall festival have not been able to participate in their spring events and in the summer programs that they normally do. And so they are so hopeful that we'll be able to have it. And we've been advised to go ahead and plan as if it is on go. And so we have two full-time people on furlough right now, and we're trying to schedule how we're gonna bring them back in. But the real focus on part of that is gonna be just the fall festival, getting ready for that in the event that it does happen. Um, and I think I've pretty much taking most of your time. I hope I ain't taking too much. But um, do you have any questions as far as um, what our plans are? Grace, do you have any comments or anything I've missed? How many do you employ there? Right, last year we had six full-time employees and we had a, um, one of our uh, folks passed away and one person retired. And so we're operationally right now at um, two full-time employees and um, we had our director um, is no longer with us, and we are looking at that whole alignment a little bit differently. That's one of the consulting um, projects we're focusing on, is can we run our organization a little bit differently than a full-time director? So to answer your question, um, two to three. On the PPP loans, I'm assuming you're looking, it sounds like you'd be eligible for the full forgiveness. Uh, you mentioned as a loan, but it, uh, especially if you hire, uh, the, bring these folks back from furlough, that's a good time for them planning for the fall festival, it sounds like. Yes. So if you yes. do, in essence, they could be almost uh, 
I don't say free labor, but uh, they would be paid for without that risk of something happening in the fall festival. You weren't able to have that. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Probably be a decision pretty soon about the fall festival because it doesn't just happen overnight. It's, they start planning as soon as the last one's over. Well, we and we have done that. We had meetings right after the last one with all of our vendors. We got feedback from them. Um, and they liked a lot of the aspects of last year's festival, the way we did it. Um, but we have people calling in right now wanting to pay their fee. And what we're telling them is you can pay your registration fee, which is $5, just to hold a spot. But we don't want to take your full payment yet. And, and they understand that. And so we're going to be very transparent with everybody as we get information. So. But we hope it happens and we're planning for that. Other questions, comments? I'd just like to make a comment as we listen to, um, you know, our tourism authority talk about the fall furniture market. I'm looking forward to that. Our schools are trying to think about, you know, what's going to happen with the schools. Will they be able to start back? And in what fashion the paper listed several different scenarios the other day and then you stand before us and you talk about the fall festival and will it happen or not. And I read an article um, the end of last week, I think it was the New York Times, don't quote me on that part of it, but it was not written from one of our state news uh, sources. And the article talked about the way we can get most, the way we can get back to those things the fastest is by doing what we're supposed to do now. By, by taking precautions as these numbers, you know, are, are showing this uh, trend going upward and the concern there is not necessarily the number of cases, but the percentage of people that are being tested. So, of course, the numbers are going to go up when you test more, but, the, but the, with that percentage increasing, then that is very concerning. And so the way that we can all um, get back to these things the fastest is to do the things we've been asked to do, because if we don't do them, then other citizens are not going to do them. And so if we can all get on board with some of these things, our restaurants can, you know, open on back up. Everything can, you know, open wider if we'll just take the safety precautions that we need to take to protect other people. Absolutely. I just had to get that in. Sorry. Well, no, thank you. And I can assure you that we're going to move forward in the, with that mindset. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. It's, you know. But right. All right, thank you. Dare, Family Crisis Center. Good evening. I also want to thank you for allowing us to come and speak before you this evening and request funding for the upcoming fiscal year. At the Family Crisis Center, I'm sure most of you all know, we don't close. COVID, recession, whatever. We have to be there 24 seven to serve the victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse, and human trafficking. The worst of the worst situations are what my people face every day. Just today, we had four restraining orders. One of the victims was a male who'd been stabbed 17 times. So this is what we're dealing with each and every day. Um, and we've been here for 42 years. So it's not likely, by the grace of God, that we're going to go anywhere um, because we need to be here. But we have some serious issues this year. Last Thursday, I was notified that we were losing $80,000 out of next year's budget. One of the federal sources. One of the federal sources. So um, we have to readjust. Our biggest fundraiser was supposed to have been in April, which would have brought in $50,000. Didn't happen. 
So we have been up and down with these budgets. I've been back and forth appealing to local folks that are friends of the agency, you know, for contributions and asking them to influence others to give, and that has worked. Um, but we have to be able to sustain. And so we make decisions on what we can sustain. This year, things were tough before COVID happened. So we closed the Archdale shelter um, because it was running in the red, number one. But number two, the folks who had given us that facility decided they wanted to charge us $1,800 a month rent. Well, that was never in the plan. So, you know, that, that ended and we are increasing the size of the Ashboro shelter through donations from one family. Um, they gave us money in memory of someone who volunteered there years ago so we can add more rooms to the existing shelter and accommodate the folks that were going to Archdale. Um, we have been providing therapy virtually, doing telehealth, our support groups the same way. So, um, like I said, we have not changed much of anything during this whole season, but we're asking for an increase of $34,000. Now, since I've been here for the last 13 years, we've had no increase in operating expenses for the yearly allocation. However, we have developed a CAC, Children's Advocacy Center, you know, over the last two years. We have increased the Archdale activity in the office there. We did over 200 therapy sessions this year in the Archdale office. So we're increasing and we need help from you guys. I'm sorry, Hope from you all, <laughs> um, because here's, here's the biggest issue. If I don't have your money, I'm going to lose federal money. And even with the, um, the loss that we, most of that was a $59,000 situation because their grant cycle runs different than ours and that's complicated. But at any rate, with what we lost, we are at 673,000 $673, from federal monies and we have to have a 20% match. Now the 20% match of that is like 127. So I'm asking you all for 75 and the rest of this, I will meet in in-kind donations and volunteer hours. Right now we have five volunteers who work 20 hours a week. So, you know, we're doing everything we can to um, boost our services and make use of all the space. I'm also shutting down, not the program, but the facility, the staying connected facility and I'm going to make some more rooms in the office space we have. It's gonna be tight, but we have to keep the program going. And like I said, we have to be able to sustain. I have to make long-term decisions on what we can sustain. Um, another huge issue we face, uh, the state budget, if we don't have that in place, then our, our state monies won't come in. And so you're looking at, and it, typically we have to have a certified budget. The other way to get our money is a loophole that says, you can base this allocation on the previous budget. Well, guess what? We didn't have a budget this year, last year, this year. So if we don't have one next year, the state can't tell me when we'll get our money. And you're looking at over $100,000 right there from one funder for the first quarter, just the first quarter. So we have to spend it out, hoping we're gonna get it six, seven months later. So we did not initially apply for a PP P loan, we didn't do that because I was concerned about double dipping federal monies. You know, we had to make sure that we were not doing that and muddy in the waters. But last week, since we've lost this money and we don't know when the state money's coming in, we can redirect our federal grants and their budgets and allow this money to pay for salaries during the time that we're not receiving the cash flow that we need from our other grants. I know this is all very confusing. <laughs> Mr. Allen, you're looking at me like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but, I love PPP, so. You know, but um, with these state and federal grants, it just gets real complicated as to what you can do, what you can't do, and you have to have the matches because they won't buy in from the local folks. So what questions do you all have for me? Clarify the increase you're saying you're asking for would be helping with the, with the, uh, with the uh, match. The federal match, yes. So we have $673,000 in federal monies that we have been granted as long as we have the 127 in a match. And your match would be 75 of that and the rest would be matched with the volunteer hours that we have and our in-kind donations. 
because they want you to diversify the sources of the match. And right now, I couldn't count on more than that much probably in volunteer hours because people can't come, our interns can't come from school like they were. So it's critical that you all do this. You mentioned volunteers. Mm -hmm. Are they able to do counseling? I mean, what what no. type of I mean, what type of volunteers are they just helping with tasks? So that these can volunteers, do their jobs? well, these volunteers are through a um, collaboration with the North Carolina Black and Aged. So all of these volunteers are 55 or older, and they're actually paid through that program, and then they place them at our agency. And see, that way, I have a guarantee they're going to show up. Because sometimes volunteers, you know, they don't show up. And so I'm having the, my front office covered every day from eight to five with two volunteers and not having to pay an office assistant. And then we have one at the shelter, two at the shelter. So um, that's what we're doing. Are you still, you having a population at the shelters during mm -hmm. COVID-19? Yes, we did. And then we had an outbreak. So then we had to clean the shelter and evacuate the shelter and put everybody in hotels. and feed them while they were in these hotels, three times a day, all of them. That's under control when we're back. Excuse me? That's under control when we're back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, the shelter's up and running, yes. So the state budget that's from last year that's still vetoed, mm -hmm. what effect did that have on your funding? This year or the upcoming year? Whatever. Well, this year, funds were delayed. I had one funder who was delayed seven months in disbursements. My major funder, like I said, was able to go through a loophole and get it distributed based on the previous year. But now, with not having one from the previous year, for next year, they can't use that loophole. So they don't know when we'll get it. They're not even adopting a budget for 2021. I'm aware. They didn't even do one. So, would that hold up your state money? It is going to hold it up until they can figure out how to get it to us. So, at least six months, I would say. At least. I mean, it held it up this past year. Yes. You know, One of our funders. Chase it down. Yeah, we had different holdups. We had state holdups and we had federal hold holdups. You know, so we had them all over the place. <clears throat> we got the money. It just takes a while. And you alluded to it, but just mentioned, yeah, you mentioned the closing of the shelter part in Archdale, mm -hmm. but you still have the office in Archdale. Yes, yes, we area. still have the, the office in Archdale, and like I said, we've done, we did 200 therapy sessions from July to December over there. Um, we have people coming in to get help with restraining orders. Before COVID, we had 17 children in a children's group in conjunction with the adult support group at the office. And just because we were involved, this board was involved in the CAC and getting mm -hmm. that going and being invested in that. I always like, if you got a kind of a quick, brief, sorry, update on, you know, how that's going service-wise and how yes. many people were. Yes. So at the CAC, we have served about 240 children since we opened, which was March of 2018. Um, we are working on our accreditation with the state. Um, there's a little bit of a snag right now because we have to have 75% of the referrals. So if DSS gets a referral, we have to, they have to send 75% to us. If law enforcement gets, you know, sends them, it has to be 75% and we're not quite at that 75%. So we're working on that. Um, we are adopting um, ref or accepting referrals for physically abused children where we weren't initially. So that has increased um, what we need to do, but the situations are so drastic that we just felt like we had to find a way to do this. We um, also um, are putting in a second therapist because the numbers have gotten so high with these children that we, we can't make them wait forever to go to therapy. That was the whole reason you know, we opened the center here in Randolph County, was to eliminate the wait time. So um, you know, they are just growing over there by leaps and bounds. And we're trying to find funding under every rock we can find. How are you doing with social services with these children? Well, um, Tracy Murphy and I have a great relationship. We talk once a week, used to have lunch once a month. Um, but she and I are working really well together. And um, on the Family Crisis Center side, as well as 
the CAC side. Um, my social workers are talking to her social workers, and so it's going really well. That's good. That's, that's an improvement. Mm -hmm. Questions, comments again? Uh, on the mental, you mentioned mental health. Mm -hmm. Are you working with Sand Hills? No. No. Would there be some coordination we could work with Sand Hills to provide those mental health services for your clients at the CAC? Well, at the CAC, we are partnering with Lorvin um, Therapy so that we can get Medicaid reimbursement. But that's how Sand Hills works. Right, partners. right, exactly, I know. But Sand Hills is not taking any new partners. Okay. So, because our therapist tried to apply there and were rejected. Okay. So, um, talk, uh, let's talk later. And so, but we've got it worked out so that we can get the reimbursement from Medicaid. Okay, okay. And that's, that's, the, that's the main thing. That's the main thing. Um, it does. Because this year we were able to get approved for Medicaid reimbursements for the CAC medical exams. So that's been a big help as well. Other questions, comments? Thank you, Darren. Thank you. Good job. All right, Boys and Girls Club. Everybody's here. Okay, uh, West Side Fire Department, Rachel. Good evening, gentlemen, ladies. Um, I got a lot of stuff wrote down, but uh, you know why we're here. <laughs> and it's a bad time of year. Uh, I mean, it is, but I would like to give you a little back to uh, why we do what we do, I guess. Um, you know, I guess this is my 27th year to be in front of y'all. Uh, well, one of you anyway, <laughs> 27 years. <laughs> um, but y'all been real good to us and I appreciate that. Um, but one thing if you hadn't noticed about Westside over the years, we do a lot of thinking outside the box. We do a lot of things that we want to do out front. Um, all fire departments do to a certain extent. Um, real quick, I'll read some of this briefly. Um, in 93, the fire department started to take another path of travel because of the way the change of course of volunteers was going. And it seems to be just trending worse as you probably heard that over the last few years. But we started ours back in 93. We hired our first paid firefighter in 93. We hired two more in 2008. We was very fortunate in 2011 to get a federal grant to move to the next phase, which was hiring 24-hour people. Um, during all this time, we have lost people. We have gained people. Um, but most of all, we've kept everything the way it is. Uh, it was set out, and I think the fire department will do the best they can. Uh, some people in the past has even asked me when things are going wrong, or if they think it's going wrong, and they wonder why we're there. And I said, well, I'll tell you a story, this ain't in my writing. Um, when I first joined the fire department, it took a year before I signed the paper. They couldn't convince me to sign the paper. When I did sign the paper, I realized that the fire department stood for something that I never realized it stood for. And that was to help the people in this district. So I've always based my stuff on that. If we can keep the same quality of function to help our people, that's what we're here for. Because there was so many people back in the 90s that hated fire departments going to EMS calls and all that stuff. And I told them, you know, they pay taxes just like anybody. So 
They deserve whatever we can do for them. So that's been our motto. We've been helping people for over 50 years. And we want to keep helping people. That's why we're asking for that increase because we got some 1901 compliance coming up that we need to deal with. We was hoping between the 1901 compliance and our DOI stuff, which y'all are used to, was going to be a year apart. Not going to happen. <laughs> uh, we got our stuff for DOI. They're coming in September. So we got to buy a few things that are outdated that needs to be replaced to make sure we get 100% credit from DOI. We don't need to lose anything. That's, that's a first because that's the homeowner's pride and joy for their insurance. Um, the NFPA 1901 standard that we are working on for the last couple of years upgrades our truck's lighting system. And that's not emergency lighting going down the road. That is lighting to help the firefighters stay safe on the scene and the citizens to be able to see us more appropriately when we're out on these interstates. Because y'all didn't know we got the Interstate 7374, we got 64, we got old 64, we got old 49, new 49. And I've told you several times, we will be having a third or better of the loop that's supposed to open up sometime this year or hopefully by the end of the year, they're like saying. So, uh, looking at that stuff for over over two years, we've, uh, y'all can look on any social media you want to. Uh, there's vehicles getting hit all the time on the highway. That's the reason we're going after these lighting packages and stuff to upgrade, to make them hopefully see us. You know, I'm a strong believer that some people are not going to see you anyway. But we got to get that, that out there. I teach safety for the fire service. I taught uh, national safety for motorcycles for over 20 years. And um, in that curriculum, you learn that the cars, the trucks, whatever they are, do not see you. They don't see the emergency vehicles. You can ask any emergency personnel you want to how many close calls they've had because people almost hit them. There have been several in this county that's got hit. We've been very fortunate we haven't. But I was looking at an article before I come here. It was talking about a new safety standard trying to help the fire departments and all emergency services with that problem. And I think the biggest thing is to educate people. And that's another thing we've been doing, trying to educate people. One thing Westside started five years ago, and uh, uh, the citizens that have took that have appreciated it. And it's called the Knoxbox system for homes. We've always had the Knoxbox system for business, but now we got a Knoxbox system for homes. And our elderly people and stuff like that, these boxes are put in a location where our firemen can get to them when they call 911, they can't get to the door. Information is documented to where we get in the house, we know what kind of medications they're on, we know where they normally stay and all this kind of stuff instead of trying to bust their doors down and, and whatever. So we really try to get that out there and we're, and we're working strong on that. And we've got several out there. It's, uh, we are on the national circuit. You can look us up, people that have moved into the district at know them systems. We've had them people call us or call me and they'd say, well, so you got a Knoxbox system. Can I get, get that? And they'll order it and then I'll go out to their house and make sure our key fits it because our key is the only one that'll fit that lock in our district. There's no other key in the world like that key. And when we started that program, people go, well, you know, volunteers, compared to like City of Asheboro and Charlotte and Greensboro and all them. You know, they pass off their key, or used to, I don't know how they do it now, but I know some of the big ones still pass off their key. One officer holds that key 
And that's his responsibility to keep up with it all day long. Ours goes in a lockbox, similar to the Knox box, and it's locked. And there's only certain people that's got a code to it. And only certain times they can really get into it. And if they get into it when they inappropriate and take that key out, I know about it. <laughs> so that key has got a track everywhere it goes. We know where it's at. We know where it's not at. So that made the people a lot more comfortable with the Knox box system. It's not just a bunch of firemen throwing their dashboard or whatever. And where did I put that key at? <laughs> now that key is very well kept up with. Um, like I said, I got a lot of stuff wrote down. But that covers it in a nutshell. The biggest thing is we're looking at the NFPA 1901. We got to get some equipment for it. The fire department feels that this plan they've been uh, pursuing for the last 12 years. Uh, Y'all have helped us graciously by giving us some, but I mean, this is a bad time of whatever, but they feel we need to keep pushing for the quality of our people. And uh, that's what, so that's you, why you see me every day when, do, when it comes to board time. Do, do you just have a team that can run first responders or do you train them after you hire them or? We train them through RCC or through ourselves, which basically is fed through RCC. Depends on if they got that course running at the time. And then I'll continue ed. We try to get through RCC because that benefits them on their FI numbers and uh, it helps everybody. You know, so, and we're talking about RCC more because uh, we do have a, a building now that was uh, given to us, the old, uh, I think I told y'all last year, but community center, Cedar Grove Community yeah. Center. And we're turning it into a training center because that will give our people or the fire department more credit for their homeowner's insurance. So that's what we're looking for. The board is still uh, keeping the place open to the community because you know we're part of the community just as anybody. And uh, we've had real good turnout with people wanting to come around and we cleaned it up a lot. We got all kinds of people to come around to go fishing down there now because the creek is clean. You know, we got a big driveway down there to where we can get our trucks to uh, pump water if we need to. So uh, you can back go by there any day and there's two or three cars down there fishing or panning for gold. And yesterday the guy was panning for gold. <laughs> so I don't know if he found any, but he was panning for gold. They wouldn't say. Huh? <laughs> they wouldn't say. <laughs> no, they wouldn't tell you, but you know, that's him. I mean, <laughs> but can I answer any questions? I mean, how many full-time employees you have now? We have seven. We got three that are 24 seven. And then we got four on a daytime shift that do rotation stuff for 12 hours and on call. And then we got uh, seven active part-time firemen that we try to fill in. And we started that back about, well, we, we've had it since the 90s, but there was a lot of firemen not really wanting to work or something. I guess they didn't need the money or whatever. Now they are, but uh, we pumped up the program a little bit because we heard from the community in our Sophia area that they wanted more representation up there, and that's what we gave them. That's where the people come from, and that's where the part-time come from. There's somebody up there every day, you know. Uh, it's tough being a volunteer to have somebody at your station every day, but the board has worked with me and we worked real hard to get that going. Uh, if you look in the budget, you'll notice the full-time people actually got deducted some for their salary. The part-time got added, trying to keep that Sophia area pumped with people so we can, you know, get them in there. We got great firemen that work at other fire departments or just work at the job that they got time to work part-time. So it helps them with money, but it helps us with coverage of people around. Um, one thing, uh, I 
guess I already mentioned, I did do when this COVID-19 come out. Um, back on March the 12th, I pulled all my people together and we said, well, we got to change things. As of March 16th, we changed, or I changed, the way we run med calls. Didn't take away from anybody how the quality of work was. It's just like I told my people, my officers, my board, is my biggest fear is we got 10 or 12 people, 15 people that's super active. I don't need 10 or 15 people on a call all the time, especially a med call. There's only so many people you can get in a room, <laughs> no matter how big the house is. Once I told them that, I said, my reasoning for what I've done, shifting things, is if I got 15 people and one person gets sick or two people get sick, and now I got them main 15 people sick, I got a very bad situation with a fire department I can't do nothing much with. Them. So we're going to back up and regroup, spread out, and make sure we don't get sick. If somebody does get sick, we had a tendency plan, and uh, you know, the training center that we got now, it was set up to uh, house the firemen or whoever for 14 days. You know, we'd quarantine them right in there for 14 days. You know, we'd make sure that whatever we needed to do, we done it to protect our people. And when I say people, our citizens is our people too not just West Side District, everybody, you know, because that's what we got to do. That's why we're here. But unfortunately, it's just like the end of the day of everything. You know, the bills still come. And we got to pay them somehow. <laughs> All right. Questions, comments? I got a comment. Uh, this is a quality bunch of guys. And uh, of course, I don't think I have to tell anybody here that. A quality bunch of guys, and what they did with the uh, Cedar Grove building area out there is invaluable uh, to the area and uh, for the people. And uh, I think uh, I just applaud you guys for stepping in and taking that over and doing what you're doing with it. It's it's commendable for a fire department to do that. And I know you're doing it and utilizing it. And, yeah. Uh, that's that's smart as well, but. You guys do a good job and deserve all the praise you get. Well, I appreciate it. And I want to commend y'all for one thing, and Donovan, Donovan's not here, but uh, he's back there. during all this. I think he's awake. <laughs> <laughs> he's I'm like, uh, okay, Donovan, this is for you too. He and Eric, um, Eric's here, both of them here. <laughs> the COVID-19, I don't know what kind of stuff y'all be getting from the citizens and stuff, but all your, uh, updates and other stuff, it really made a difference for people to listen to what's happening. Thank you. You know, so I just want y'all to hear that from me, from Check. what I've heard. It, it's made a difference. Thank you. Thank you. So, Very any, much. any more questions? Thank you, Rachel. All right. Thank you very much. Ambleman? Good evening. I'm not going to take up too much of your time. Uh, my name is Michael Smith. I'm the assistant chief at Randleman Fire Department. Uh, we're asking for a three cent increase from uh, 12 to 15 cent. The last time we requested an increase was in 2014 with our acquisition of Sophia Fire Department. Um, since that time, we've had about a 40% increase in call volume, uh, approximately 25% increase in personnel cost, as well as a uh, diminishing volunteer force, like every other fire department in the county, I'm sure. Um, the city implemented a fairly uh, extensive capital improvement plan uh, last year um, that started last year we purchased a new tanker truck um, this year the board has already approved a uh, new squad or medical truck uh, with all intentions of purchasing a uh, medium to heavy rescue truck next fiscal year um, all at the same time we're searching for a piece of property to build a much needed 
uh, fire station uh, to replace our current fire station. I believe Commissioner Haywood has had an opportunity uh, to tour that facility, and I want to extend that invitation to the rest of you as well. Please didn't come by. Didn't slide down the pole. Didn't slide down the pole. <laughs> but I want to extend that to you as well. Come by and see what we're working with every day. There you go, That's about it. I want to thank you for your consideration in advance. I just, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer those to the best of my ability. What direction are you looking for to build? Uh, well, we're trying to stay within a quarter mile of our current location. I believe that's probably going to be best for uh, the citizens as far as not knocking somebody out of our uh, rating range. So as long as we can stay pretty close. I don't, there's not many options in that location when you're looking for a three to four acre piece of property inside the city. Um, but they've got a few that they're eyeballing. How big is your department personnel wise? I mean, uh, we have 20 full-time personnel. I believe I listed 28 volunteers. That, uh, that's what I have on the state roster, but most of that, probably 85 to 90 percent, is part-time personnel. Our active volunteer force is probably between eight to ten active volunteers that show up to help us. You're like everybody else, the, you're oh, looking yeah. for anybody you can get. Yeah, we'll take anybody we can get at this point in time. All right. Other questions? Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Okay, Liberty, east side. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Matt Talbot. I'm the fire chief at Liberty um, Northeast Fire District. Um, we are asking for a three cent increase for personnel. Um, I can sit up here and echo the same things that those two guys um, have said, but we have a decrease in volunteers. Um, that's not gonna go away anytime soon. So uh, the only way to make up with that is full-time and part-time staffing. We currently have four, including myself, four full-time firemen, um, about 10 part-time and uh, five or six uh, volunteers. And those are the folks that I count that live in the Northeast Fire District or in town that can truly get there in a timely manner and make a difference. Um, so that's just, that's the world we, we live in now. So we want to make up with that with part-time and full-time folks. Um, our DOI rating in town for the Department of Insurance is a class three. And in the county, Northeast District, it's a class four. So um, we still provide a good service. Um, we just typically do it with paid people. This is something uh, we've talked for the last two or three years, I guess, and it's something that's not new. Uh, the lack of volunteers. I, when I opened up the fact and saw you had five volunteers and some of these other departments have, you know, 25 and 30, I thought well, that's got to be wrong. He left the one, at least left the one off of, in front of the five, but um, it is getting to be a big, big issue and you just having to pay people, I guess. Is that right? Um, yeah, um, and Liberty is a, you know, I hear these other departments, maybe not fire departments, talk about volunteers. Well, it's hard to get a volunteer to come and do, let's say, secretarial work. How hard is it to get a volunteer to get up at three o'clock in the morning and deal with the things that we have to deal with? And, and it's, yeah, it's tough. And get up and have a family and. And I don't know, uh, I could, like I say, I can echo everything those guys said, but we're all in the same boat. We might be in different parts of the county, but it's the, it's the same thing. All right, other questions, comments? 
Thank you guys thank for you, letting me speak. And uh, Commissioner Allen, thank you for always answering our, our call. No, thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate y'all. Okay, our, uh, our next uh, presenter tonight is EDC for their annual request. And then uh, we are required to hold a public hearing just for the EDC budget tonight. So that'll be separate from the uh, full budget public hearing. Hey, um, this, this is, is this last? Pardon? Say last. Mm -hmm. Yes. Presenter. Okay. Um, Gary, did you want to, did you come to the Boys and Girls Club? Yes, please. I was supposed to wait outside and get here. You were here at the table. Boys and Girls Club. Oh. I thought they were supposed to wait outside, so oh. they've been here since seven. Okay, let's go back then to the Boys and Girls Club. Come on up. Glad you finally got in. I'm Gary Parks, and uh, thank you very much for letting us be here. Uh, we won't take much of your time. We're just here mostly to say thank you. Since we've met last, since I've been here last, we uh, moved again, not because we wanted to, but just because of circumstances at, at the facility where we were actually in Seoul. But anyway, we're in the good hands of the uh, parishioners at uh, the first ENR church, and they're, they have welcomed us with open arms, and we're grateful. Uh, I wanted just to uh, say that thank you, and thank you for so many years of support from the county. And at this time, I want to just introduce you to our new CEO, Floyd Johnson. He comes here from Vance County, and uh, he comes from a seven club, 12 club. From where? Yes. Oxford, yes, Anyway, he's going to speak to you for just a minute, and once again, thank you. Good evening, and thank you we, um, for uh, for letting us come for a few minutes and just to say thank you. Uh, we really appreciate all the strong support that the county has given. It's um, I've been here serving as the CEO for about 10 months. I came in August of last year. So um, just um, excited about working with uh, with the people here in Randolph County to support uh, Boys and Girls Club. There's been, uh, the, the support has been great so far that, that I've been here and displaying towards the organization. And your support over the years has enabled us to serve hundreds of children annually from many locations in Asheboro. We have reached, as Gary mentioned, we recently moved to the first DNR church on Cliff Road. It's right across from Lindley Park Elementary School. And so we're really excited about that because the church leadership has been excellent to work with just so far. And our location right across from Lindley Park uh, makes it an ideal location that we look forward to serving youth from for many years. We, we, we don't like moving a lot, but, but we, we uh, we have a good relationship so far with them. We just recently hired, in the middle of this pandemic, we hired a new unit director. Caleb Hughes is his name. Uh, he was formerly with Asheboro City Schools, and now he works for, with us. We're really excited about him. He's a, he's a, a native of Randolph County, and he lives in, lives in Asheboro now, so we, we are looking really forward to doing that. He's been very instrumental. We are open. Um, we have some uh, lower numbers. Uh, we just open for uh, summer camp, and he's been very instrumental in getting us ready for that for that process and everything like that right now. As we move forward, we also look forward to working with other communities here in Randolph County to uh, to determine ways to serve more youth. And I just wanted to thank you again for your support. This is our newest uh, brochure that I passed out that we have uh, with some numbers from our last fiscal year. We will have a newer one coming up. Um, probably around September or so. We're on a, a July 1, June 30 fiscal year. So these reflect, reflect the numbers from last fiscal year. But we are also uh, right now tracking about the same. The coronavirus is kind of, um, I think our membership, the last time I looked at it was around 120 kids. 
um, which we probably would if we ended the year with 138. So we're going to be in that in that um, range th this coming um, this coming year too. So how how are you handling this through the social distancing and yes, sir. number so limitations of that sort? So we we work closely with Boys and Girls Clubs of America. They they've given us a social distancing kind of calculation form format. Yep. And so we take the square footage of what we're allowed, we plug it into that formula, and that's how we determine how many kids we could serve. We, um, last week was a very low week for us. We had about 15 children that were in our program starting out. Now we're calling, we can serve up to, I think it's 45 to 50 children um, based on the square footage we have there. Um, we're checking temperatures every day. Uh, we've got one of the thermal scans. We, we check our staff. All of our uh, staff, we've issued uh, uh, masks for them to wear. Uh, we've encouraged children to wear masks. Uh, we're not making it mandatory at this point unless the state makes it mandatory. And we, we've spaced out all the, uh, all the different activities to where there's only, uh, it's, I think it's right now, well, it's very low, but uh, we're having, our groups are about one to nine right now at, at the maximum. I was chairman of the High Point Board when we established the Boys and Girls Club here in Asheboro oh, years great. ago, and I'm still on their advisory board, and I know you've gone through some uh, evolutions uh, in recent yes, sir. couple of years or so, and I sure hope, I, I stay in touch with uh, uh, Robbie and some of the folks up in High Point, oh, and I, I hope that things are settling down and uh, because it's been a it's been a good club, and I, I, I thank you for uh, leadership for leadership and and right. persevering through all that and staying the course because it's important right. to the youth that you serve. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Any other questions? So E and R is the new home over here. Is that yes. the, what yeah. you were saying? I saw it in brochure. So do you utilize like, the fellowship hall down there and some of the classrooms on that first floor? Or how yes, do you sir. Work? Uh, we're primarily in the basement area that was a fellowship hall they allow us to use and then I think four or five other areas now. So we have a lot more space than when we, when I came here we were at Sunset and uh, it's a lot more space, a lot more areas to break, break uh, groups down and, and do more things with other than just, just the wide open uh, place there. So it's, it's been really good and they're great to work with. Uh, they've, they've come in, they've done a bunch of stuff. They're, um, there's some drainage things, some problems that they're, they're solving, you know, with an older building. One of the rooms floods a little bit, and so, so they're working through that. And, but they just, they've gone out of their way, really, to, to be accommodating for us. That's good. I know they love having you. I don't know how you keep kids out of that creek this time of year with all the rain. <laughs> I imagine that's a challenge. It's funny, I'm a foster parent, and yesterday we took, I have two, uh, two children right now, and they are, uh, when you mentioned creek, one of the boys, he's, his back sore right now because he was picking up boulders and putting them <laughs> <laughs> together outside. And I know exactly what you're talking about. All right. Any other thank questions? You. Again, thank you very much. We thank really appreciate it. And, and I, hope, I hope that you have stability in the home now with, with your new location. I, I, in addition yes, to personnel, I know that it's also been an issue. I've, I've been in in some of those discussions and uh, hope, hope that it works out. Yes, sir, we do too. Yes. yes sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Kevin, we'll do EDC now. Uh, good evening, Chairman Fry, members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. I want to start by just saying thank you to Randolph County Board of Commissioners for the long uh, term support for the Randolph County Economic Development Corporation. We are this year celebrating 35 years in existence. So our founding date was 1985. And over those 35 years, we have helped to facilitate about $1.9 billion of investment in Randolph County and uh, something over 12,000 jobs. And so it's been a privilege. We, we also recognize that we don't create jobs. We don't invest. We help you create an environment that's conducive to companies coming and investing and creating jobs in our community, and that's to benefit all of us around Randolph County. We are not requesting an increase in 
appropriation in this coming fiscal year so we thank you for what you've done and ask that you would just continue to hold the line on that appropriation just a quick update over the past 12 to 18 months we've seen quite a bit of change in the edc and i think we're seeing some positive things that are happening not that things weren't good but building on a good foundation and continuing to improve and make things better um, 12 months ago i was i was given the privilege of of leading this organization the board granted me the uh, promotion to president of the organization and we had some re, uh, restructuring of our organization back in October. We hired Crystal Geddes to serve as our business recruitment director, and she has come in and hit the ground running with some great, um, great ideas and great resources. Uh, we have, over this past several months with COVID, provided resources and technical assistance to a wide variety of businesses. Um, everything from very beginning, are we essential or are we not? How do we figure that out? to help us understand what this PPP loan process looks like and how do we qualify for forgiveness and everything in between. So lots of questions that we've received and lots of support that we've offered. And of course, we've been coordinating closely with Sam Varner, who has been your liaison to the business community and helping to spread that information that he's presenting as well. Over the past um, 12 months or so, again, we have we have helped to facilitate around $700,000 worth of grant commitments in Randolph County for expanding businesses, um, specifically for Randolph County. You recall, we worked with the Lawrence Industries and helped to help Randolph County secure about $230,000 in building reuse grant for that specific company. We also are continuing to focus um, on the existing industry that we have in the county. We established a Randolph Industrial Council this year, and our plan is quarterly meetings of that group, and that got put on hold a little bit over these past few months, but we have had good response to that in the two meetings that we were able to hold. And so that is, again, just an emphasis on supporting that existing business base and helping them to thrive and survive here in Randolph County. We are continuing to redouble our efforts regarding product development, and we've had some conversations recently about those efforts. We need sites, we need buildings, and we're putting a plan together to pursue improving that inventory. Uh, we've developed a strategic plan. We have our board meeting tomorrow morning and anticipate the board approving that strategic plan that will really help to more specifically guide our focus and program activity moving forward as well. I, I could continue on and I won't do that because at some point in the next couple of months, I'll hopefully we'll be here and pre presenting an annual report and providing a little more detail on all of those things. Suffice it to say that we're in a good spot. We're staffed well, we're in a good location, thanks to uh, the county. And we have a lot of opportunity ahead and we rely very heavily on Randolph County to help us accomplish that which is good for all of us. So thank you for all that you've done in the past and uh, would appreciate your consideration of continuing to fund us at the same level in the coming fiscal year. Happy to answer any questions that any of you may have. Okay, questions? All right, if you, uh, just a moment. We are required to hold a public hearing. Um, so I will open the public hearing regarding the budget request of uh, Randolph County Economic Development Corporation. That budget request is for $334,500, which as Kevin has mentioned, is a uh, continuation of current funding. Uh, so with that, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone here tonight who wishes to speak to the uh, Economic Development Corporation's annual budget request? Hearing none, we will close the public hearing. And uh, anybody have any other questions of Kevin? All right. That will be a part of our final discussions uh, as we approve the budget on the 25th. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it is now, uh, anybody have any other questions or comments on any of our presenters tonight or any of those issues? Um, 
then we are uh, holding a public hearing relative to the 2020-21 uh, budget and I will open the public hearing for that purpose and uh, I'll ask County Manager how have we received any comments through social media that regarding the budget is there anyone else here tonight who wishes to speak to this budget? Any questions that you have? Yes, sir. Please come forward and uh, introduce yourself. Yes, sir. Hey, my name is Sean Walker. Pardon? Uh, Sean Walker. That'd be easier by town. Good. Okay, much better. We're good. You can move your mouth now. Uh, question would be probably on the sheriff's budget, something I believe you even received a new one this evening. We're kind of at a loss at this point exactly what that budget is. It wasn't published because he changed it mid-screen. It didn't allow time for public comment or review. And I guess our main concern at this point would still be it's been increased 20% since Mr. Seabolt took over. We still only have 49 patrolmen. We're kind of confused on, are we ever going to increase patrol? You have the same number you had. You gained 610 people in two years. You increase his budget 20%. But we still only have 49 patrolmen. I mean, has he explained that? And I watched, uh, I watched the hearing, but we didn't see the slideshow. He thought he was cutting the budget. He's like, I'm gonna save some money. But then he did some fuzzy math and said, no, 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 but I still want my cars. And somebody asked him about emails, were the emails made public? We don't know what it is right now he's asking for. He's saving by not hiring but to the same extent he wants to keep his capital out there. Do we intend to make these public? Well, yeah, there, 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 is, there is no, um, nothing in this budget for capital outlay for his, for his cars. Right. That, that's not included. Some of that increase has been in preparation of the expansion at the, at the jail, the detention center. Yes, sir. Uh, some of that was last year and another uh, part of that in this proposed budget, although not as much as was originally requested. Yes. And he did bring a, uh, it, it, was a, it was a result of the comment or presentation of his budget here last Thursday night, um, where they changed the start time for the next round of hiring. Yes, sir. Which you referred to. You saw that. Yes, yes sir, I saw that. Oh, oh, oh. Yes. And he that, said we're going to save some money there, but yes. I want to put it back towards my capital outlay request. Well, I in all fairness, I think since the sheriff presented that um, and we all presented that, Jonathan, to, to our board, can we take that slideshow and that extra spreadsheet and put that on the county website with the budget? I mean, since it was really a change proposed. Would that be? Yeah. And, okay, or if we'll Will wants to speak to it, and, and I know Justin is here tonight, who's the finance officer for the sheriff. Um, I think everybody needs to see yeah. those, those changes resulted in about a, I stuck it back here in my book, but 283,000 savings. And we did, know, we did know that the jail was coming. We understand that. Yes. But Pretty much every other department is on a freeze. But he still wants a few more million dollars. The schools, if I remember right, in the budget actually did not get what they requested. So as far as most of the agencies, with the exception of registered deeds, it needs a scanner, which makes sense. He's getting the biggest increase. For those, for those proposed positions. Correct, which he the is now. Jail, the, the, the expansion of the jail would act, is actually scheduled to be open at the end of this budget year. So he's got to have those positions hired and trained. Yes, sir. And we spread that out. Right. From, which we, and I, and I, I know, but now we're changing the dates. And yeah. 
we were good up until the part where he said, well, we're going to be able to save some money here. We're going to chip away at this right here. I want my cars now. we got to order them now. But, you know, we thought, okay, well, maybe he's going to actually cut down his budget a little bit. And he comes right back and he goes, no, 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 but I want to use them for cars. Because I'm not really hiring these people until later. But he's still going to hire the people. But I want my cars. All in the same time, why over three, four years, we can't get one more patrolman. That's I mean, the, the staff's even increased 40, 45 over the past couple of years. We still can't get one patrolman. We can't even break the 50 mark. At the numbers. Yeah, the, the savings is $269,525. Yes, sir. That, that's, that's the change that was brought back to us tonight because there was some discussion at Thursday night of just what, how that, there was two or three different numbers floating around, so we asked for a specific number, and that number came from our finance officer, not from the sheriff's office. Right, and I understand that. But yeah. And that's a savings not from last year, from his proposed. From it's his from his proposed, proposed. Yeah, yes. Like your, to your point. Kind right. Of, yeah, so yes. Something we've not seen yet until yeah. but, I think he But was, I do think it's fair that we include that. I mean, because it's all public information request, you know. Yes. That, you know, yes. The citizens we ought will, to be able to we see will get it what posted. specifically he changed in his ask. Uh, that's right. fair. And that was it. I'm sorry. No. no appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, thank, thank you for you. waiting. Thank you for your patience. your patience and input. Anyone else tonight who wishes to speak regarding this budget? Uh, any comments from the commissioners from what we've heard? I know we'll uh, be here for budget discussions, uh, which will be a week from Thursday night on the 25th. And um, I'm sure we'll, I'll be working with Will and uh, uh, Vice Chair Allen and I will be, be working to see any changes uh, relative to the uh, comments that we've heard. I, I, I know that some, in, in particular, um, the uh, Family Crisis Center, which leverages more money for them, uh, is an issue. There's no, there's no, um, there's no money in here for county employees. There's no change in funding for public schools. Uh, we basically have staged that, um, depending on how the revenues um, come out as we go through the year. You know, right now, as it relates to the budget that's going to end in a couple of weeks, um, we're, we're doing okay. Uh, our question is a year from now. And uh, what happens if, if, the, if the worst would happen? on revenue and, and our biggest threat is in the sales tax area. Um, and if that, that really think, and I know some folks that if you went by and looked at Walmart and Lowe's, you'd think nothing changed, but there's a lot more, there's a lot more sales involved than, uh, than uh, Walmart and Lowe's. Uh, and, but the other side of that, maybe, maybe that, softens a potential loss a little bit, seriously. So we're due another sales tax this week, Will, and that will be for first quarter, March, ended March, first quarter. Uh, we, we drag a quarter, so uh, that's probably not going to tell us as much as second quarter, which we won't get until September. So that's, that's when that whole April, May, and June will be told, when, when all these uh, closures and stay at home and that sort really took effect. So that's, um, that's what we're dealing with right now. And um, we, we have had, we've had a good recovery since the recession. Um, and we've been able to, to do some things uh, that were put off for a long time. Those of you that been involved and remember, you know, for 
two or three years, we didn't fund any, not only did we not fund any additional pay for our employees, we didn't even fund their 401k. We didn't even fund their retirement. And, um, but we weathered that and, and we've come back, we've done some good things with our schools. We're on a plan now to do our 12 hour shifts for EMS to enable us in these, to, to, uh, to hire and maintain quality staff. And uh, we do have the expansion at, at the jail. Um, and I, you know, this is the fifth sheriff that I have worked with. Um, and sheriffs have their budget and they are, they are elected officials um, and they are accountable. So we will work and uh, try to find answers to these same, to these same questions. But, um, that's, that's, that's the way the, the sheriff's office has operated. Um, and I will say there's, there's nothing in this budget related to the garage. <coughs> we, I know, I know, we, we have had that question. <laughs> <laughs> We've had that question, but there's, there's nothing in, in this, in that budget that, that is related to it. Chairman, I might point out to Mr. Walker that uh, the sheriff currently has uh, a pretty good restricted uh, balance in the restricted funds. So that, as far as I know, could be used on, on vehicles. Uh, it can't be used on personnel because there are you know, rules about how that can be spent. But uh, there's a uh, around three hundred thousand dollars there, so it's not a huge amount, uh, but it certainly would go a long way and and could be used for um, some of those vehicles. Yes, that that word is hard for me to say, so I say restricted funds. <laughs> yes. All right. Any other comments or questions tonight? Thank all of you for your participation and uh, answering questions. And uh, we thank you for your uh, social distancing tonight and observing uh, the new setup for, uh, for these meetings. And uh, is there any other business before this board? Do I have a motion to adjourn? Do we adjourn? Thank you, Mr. Allen. We are adjourned. adjourned. Thank all you folks at home tonight, again, for, uh, for listening in. Thank you. Surgeries are for me a lot of